This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, March 1, 1907, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 13, by Mark Twain. As I have said, that vast plot of Tennessee land was held by my father twenty years, in fact. When he died in 1847, we began to manage it ourselves. Forty years afterwards, we had managed it all away, except ten thousand acres, and got nothing to remember the sales by. About 1887, possibly it was earlier, the ten thousand went. My brother found a chance to trade it for a house and a lot in the town of Cory, in the oil regions of Pennsylvania. About 1894 he sold this property for two hundred and fifty dollars. That ended the Tennessee land. If any penny of cash ever came out of my father's wise investment but that, I have no recollection of it. No, I am overlooking a detail. It furnished me a field for cellars and a book. Out of my half of the book I got fifteen thousand or twenty thousand. Out of the play I got seventy-five thousand or eighty thousand, just about a dollar an acre. It is curious. I was not alive when my father made the investment, therefore he was not intending any partiality. Yet I was the only member of the family that ever profited by it. I shall have occasion to mention this land again now and then, as I go along, for it influenced our life in one way or another during more than a generation. Whenever things grew dark, it rose and put out its hopeful seller's hand and cheered us up and said, Do not be afraid. Trust in me. Wait. It kept us hoping and hoping during forty years and forsook us at last. It put our energies to sleep and made visionaries of us, dreamers and indolent. We were always going to be rich next year. No occasion to work. It is good to begin life poor. It is good to begin life rich. These are wholesome. But to begin it prospectively rich. The man who has not experienced it cannot imagine the curse of it. My parents removed to Missouri in the early thirties. I do not remember just when, for I was not born then, and cared nothing for such things. It was a long journey in those days, and must have been a rough and tiresome one. The home was made in the wee village of Florida, in Monroe County, and I was born there in 1835. The village contained a hundred people, and I increased the population by one per cent. It is more than the best man in history ever did for any other town. It may not be modest in me to refer to this, but it is true. There is no record of a person doing as much, not even Shakespeare, but I did it for Florida and it shows that I could have done it for any place, even London, I suppose. Recently some one in Missouri has sent me a picture of the house I was born in. Heretofore I have always stated that it was a palace, but I shall be more guarded now. I remember only one circumstance connected with my life in it. I remember it very well, though. I was but two and a half years old at the time. The family packed up everything and started in wagons for Hannibal, on the Mississippi, thirty miles away. Toward night, when they camped and counted up the children, one was missing. I was the one. I had been left behind. Parents ought always to count the children before they start. I was having a good enough time playing by myself until I found that the doors were fastened and that there was a grisly deep silence brooding over the place. I knew then that the family were gone and that they had forgotten me. I was well frightened, and I made all the noise I could, but no one was near, and it did no good. I spent the afternoon in captivity, and was not rescued until the gloaming had fallen and the place was alive with ghosts. My brother Henry was six months old at that time. I used to remember his walking into a fire outdoors when he was a week old. It was remarkable in me to remember a thing like that which occurred when I was so young and it was still more remarkable that I should cling to the delusion for thirty years that I did remember it, for of course it never happened. He would not have been able to walk at that age. If I had stopped to reflect, I should not have burdened my memory with that impossible rubbish so long. It is believed by many people that an impression deposited in a child's memory within the first two years of its life cannot remain there five years, but that is an error. 
the incident of Benvenue Cellini and the Salamander must be accepted as authentic and trustworthy, and then that remarkable and indisputable instance in the experience of Helen Keller. However, I will speak of that another time. For many years I believed that I remembered helping my grandfather drink his whiskey toddy when I was six weeks old. But I do not tell about that any more now. I am grown old, and my memory is not as active as it used to be. When I was younger I could remember anything, whether it had happened or not. But my faculties are decaying now, and soon I shall be, so I cannot remember any but the things that happened. It is said to go to pieces like this, but we all have to do it. My uncle, John A. Quarles, was a farmer, and his place was in the country four miles from Florida. He had eight children, and fifteen or twenty negroes, and was also fortunate in other ways, particularly in his character. I have not come across a better man than he was. I was his guest for two or three months every year, from the fourth year after we removed to Hannibal, till I was eleven or twelve years old. I have never consciously used him or his wife in a book, but his farm has come very handy to me in literature, once or twice. In Huck Finn and in Tom Sawyer Detective, I moved it down to Arkansas. It was all of six hundred miles, but it was no trouble. It was not a very large farm, five hundred acres, perhaps, but I could have done it if it had been twice as large. And as for the morality of it, I cared nothing for that. I would move a state if the exigencies of literature required it. It was a heavenly place for a boy, that farm of my Uncle John's. The house was a double log one, with a spacious floor roofed in, connecting it with the kitchen. In the summer the table was set in the middle of that shady and breezy floor, and the sumptuous meals, well, it makes me cry to think of them. Fried chicken, roast pig, wild and tame turkeys, ducks and geese, venison just killed, squirrels, rabbits, pheasants, partridges, prairie chickens, biscuits, hot batter cakes, hot buckwheat cakes, hot wheat bread, hot rolls, hot corn pone, fresh corn boiled on the ear, succotash, butter beans, string beans, tomatoes, peas, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, buttermilk, sweet milk, clabber, watermelons, musk melons, cantaloupes, all fresh from the garden, apple pie, peach pie, pumpkin pie, apple dumplings, peach cobbler, I can't remember the rest. The way that the things were cooked was perhaps the main splendor, particularly a certain few of the dishes. For instance, the cornbread, the hot biscuits and wheat bread, and the fried chicken. These things have never been properly cooked in the North. In fact, no one there is able to learn the art, so far as my experience goes. The North thinks it knows how to make cornbread, but this is gross superstition. Perhaps no bread in the world is quite as good as southern cornbread, and perhaps no bread in the world is quite so bad as the northern imitation of it. The North seldom tries to fry chicken, and this is well. The art cannot be learned north of the lines of Mason and Dixon, nor anywhere in Europe. This is not hearsay. It is experience that is speaking. In Europe it is imagined that the custom of serving various kinds of bread, blazing hot, is American. But that is too broad a spread. It is custom in the South, but is much less than that in the North. In the North and in Europe hot bread is considered unhealthy. This is probably another funny superstition, like the European superstition that ice water is unhealthy. Europe does not need ice water, and does not drink it. And yet, notwithstanding this, its word for it is better than ours, because it describes it, whereas ours doesn't. Europe calls it iced water. Our word describes water made from melted ice, a drink which we have but little acquaintance with. It seems a pity that the world should throw away so many good things merely because they are unwholesome. I doubt if God has given us any refreshment which, taken in moderation, is unwholesome except microbes. Yet there are people who strictly deprive themselves of each and every edible, drinkable, smokable, which has in any way acquired a shady reputation. They pay this price for health, and health is all they get for it. How strange it is! It is like paying out your whole fortune for a cow that has gone dry. The farmhouse stood in the middle of a very large yard, and the yard was fenced on three sides with rails, and on the rear side with high palings. Against these stood the smoke-house. Beyond the palings was the orchard. 
Beyond the orchard were the negro quarter and the tobacco fields. The front yard was entered over a stile, made of sawed-off logs of graduated height. I do not remember any gate. In a corner of the front yard were a dozen lofty hickory trees and a dozen black walnuts, and in the nutting season riches were to be gathered there. Down a piece, abreast the house, stood a little log cabin against the rail fence, and there the woody hill fell sharply away, past the barns, the corn crib, the stables, and the tobacco-curing house, to a limpid brook which sang along over its gravelly bed, and curved and frisked in and out, and here and there, and yonder in the deep shade of overhanging foliage and vines. A divine place for wading, and it had swimming pools, too, which were forbidden to us, and therefore much frequented by us, for we were little Christian children, and had early been taught the value of forbidden fruit. In the little log cabin lived a bedridden, white-headed slave-woman, whom we visited daily, and looked upon with awe, for we believed she was upwards of a thousand years old, and had talked with Moses. The younger negroes credited these statistics, and had furnished them to us in good faith. We accommodated all the details which came to us about her, and so we believed that she had lost her health in the long desert trip coming out of Egypt, and had never been able to get it back again. She had a round, bald place on the crown of her head, and we used to creep around and gaze at it in reverent silence, and reflect that it was caused by fright through seeing Pharaoh drowned. We called her Aunt Hannah, southern fashion. She was superstitious like the other negroes. Also, like them, she was deeply religious. Like them, she had great faith in prayer, and employed it in all ordinary exigencies, but not in cases where a dead certainty of result was urgent. Whenever witches were around, she tied up the remnant of her wool in little tufts with white thread, and this promptly made the witches impotent. All the negroes were friends of ours, and with those of our own age we were in effect comrades. I say in effect, using the phrase as a modification. We were comrades, and yet not comrades. Color and condition interposed a subtle line which both parties were conscious of, and which rendered complete fusion impossible. We had a faithful and affectionate good friend, ally, and adviser in Uncle Dan'l, a middle-aged slave whose head was the best one in the negro quarter, whose sympathies were wide and warm, and whose heart was honest and simple and knew no guile. He has served me well these many, many years. I have not seen him for more than half a century, and yet, spiritually, I have had his welcome company a good part of that time, and have staged him in books under his own name and as Jim and carted him all around to Hannibal, down the Mississippi on a raft, and even across the desert of Sahara in a balloon. And he has endured it all with the patience and friendliness and loyalty which were his birthright. It was on the farm that I got my strong liking for his race, and my appreciation of certain of its fine qualities. This feeling and this estimate have stood the test of sixty years and more, and have suffered no impairment. The black face is as welcome to me now as it was then. In my schoolboy days I had no aversion to slavery. I was not aware that there was anything wrong about it. No one arraigned it in my hearing. The local papers said nothing against it. The local pulpit taught us that God approved it, and that it was a holy thing, and that the doubter need only look in the Bible if he wished to settle his mind. And then the texts were read aloud to us to make the matter sure. If the slaves themselves had an aversion to slavery, they were wise and said nothing. In Hannibal we seldom saw a slave misused. On the farm, never. There was, however, one small incident of my boyhood days which touched this matter, and it must have meant a good deal to me, or it would not have stayed in my memory, clear and sharp, vivid and shadowless, all these slow drifting years. We had a little slave boy whom we had hired from someone there in Hannibal. He was from the eastern shore of Maryland and had been brought away from his family and his friends, halfway across the American continent, and sold. He was a cheery spirit, innocent and gentle, and the pixiest creature that ever was, perhaps. All day long he was singing, whistling, yelling, whooping and laughing. It was maddening, devastatingly unendurable. At last, one day, I lost all my temper and went raging to my mother and said, Sandy had been singing for an hour without a single break and I couldn't stand it, and wouldn't she please shut him up. The tears came into her eyes, and her lip trembled, and she said something like this, 
poor thing, when he sings it shows that he is not remembering, and that comforts me. But when he is still, I am afraid he is thinking, and I cannot bear it. He will never see his mother again. If he can sing, I must not hinder it, but be thankful for it. If you were older you would understand me. Then that friendless child's noise would make you glad. It was a simple speech, and made up of small words, but it went home, and Sandy's noise was not a trouble to me any more. She never used large words, but she had a natural gift to making small ones do effective work. She lived to reach the neighborhood of ninety years, and was capable with her tongue to the last, especially when a meanness or injustice roused her spirit. She has come handy to me several times in my books, where she figures as Tom Sawyer's Aunt Polly. I fitted her out with a dialect, and tried to think up other improvements for her, but did not find any. I used Sandy once, also. It was in Tom Sawyer. I tried to get him to whitewash the fence, but it did not work. I do not remember what name I called him by in the book. I can see the farm yet, with perfect clearness. I can see all its belongings, all its details, the family room of the house, with a trundle bed in one corner and a spinning wheel in another. A wheel whose rising and falling wail, heard from a distance, was the mournfulest of all sounds to me, and made me homesick and low-spirited, and filled my atmosphere with the wandering spirits of the dead. The vast fireplace, piled high on the winter nights, with flaming hickory logs, from whose ends a sugary sap bubbled out, but did not go to waste, for we scraped it off and ate it. The lazy cat spread out on the rough hearthstones. The drowsy dogs braced against the jams and blinking. My aunt in one chimney-corner knitting, my uncle in the other smoking his corn-cob pipe, the slick and carpetless oak floor faintly mirroring the dancing flame-tongues and freckled with black indentations where fire-coals had popped out and died a leisurely death, half a dozen children romping in the background twilight, split-bottom chairs here and there, some with rockers a cradle out of service, but waiting with confidence. In the early cold mornings a snuggle of children in shirts and chemises occupying the hearthstone and procrastinating. They could not bear to leave that comfortable place and go out on the wind-swept floor space between the house and the kitchen where the general tin basin stood and wash. Along outside of the front fence ran the country road, dusty in the summer-time, and a good place for snakes. They liked to lie in it and sun themselves. When there were rattlesnakes or puff-adders, we killed them. When there were black-snakes or racers or belonged to the fabled hoop-breed, we fled without shame. When they were house-snakes or garters, we carried them home and put them in Aunt Patsy's work-basket for a surprise. For she was prejudiced against snakes, and always, when she took the basket in her lap and they began to climb out of it, disoriented her mind. She never could seem to get used to them. Her opportunities went for nothing and she was always cold towards bats, too, and could not bear them. And yet I think a bat is as friendly a bird as there is. My mother was Aunt Patsy's sister, and had the same wild superstitions. A bat is beautifully soft and silky. I do not know any creature that is pleasanter to touch, or is more grateful for caressings, if offered in the right spirit. I know all about these coleoptera, because our great cave three miles below Hannibal was multitudinously stocked with them, and often I brought them home to amuse my mother with. It was easy to manage, if it was a school day, because then I had ostensibly been to school and hadn't any bats, and she was not a suspicious person, but full of trust and confidence, and when I said, "'There's something in my coat pocket for you,' she would put her hand in. But she always took it out again, herself. I didn't have to tell her. It was remarkable the way she couldn't learn to like private bats. I think she was never in the cave in her life, but everybody else went there. Many excursion parties came from considerable distances up and down the river to visit the cave. It was miles in extent, and was a tangled wilderness of narrow and lofty clefts and passages. It was an easy place to get lost in. Anybody could do it, including the bats. I got lost in it myself, along with a lady, and our last candle burned down to almost nothing before we glimpsed the search-party's lights winding about in the distance. Injun Joe, the half-breed, got lost in there once, and would have starved to death if the bats had run short. But there was no chance of that. There were myriads of them. He told me all his story. 
In the book called Tom Sawyer, I starved him entirely to death in the cave, but that was in the interest of art. It never happened. General Gaines, who was our first town drunkard before Jimmy Finn got the place, was lost in there for the space of a week, and finally pushed his handkerchief out of a hole in the hilltop near Saverton, several miles down the river from the cave's mouth, and someone saw it and dug him out. There is nothing the matter with his statistics except the handkerchief. I knew him for years, and he hadn't any. But it could have been his nose. That would attract attention. Beyond the road where the snakes sunned themselves was a dense young thicket, and through it a dim-litted path led a quarter of a mile. Then out of the dimness one emerged abruptly upon a level great prairie which was covered with wild strawberry plants, vividly starred with prairie pinks, and walled in on all sides by forests. The strawberries were fragrant and fine, and in the season we were generally there in the crisp freshness of the early morning, while the dew-beads still sparkled upon the grass, and the woods were ringing with the first songs of the birds. Down the forest slopes to the left were the swings. They were made of bark stripped from hickory saplings. When they became dry they were dangerous. They usually broke when a child was forty feet in the air, and this was why so many bones had to be mended every year. I had no ill luck myself, but none of my cousins escaped. There were eight of them, and at one time and another they broke fourteen arms among them. But it cost next to nothing, for the doctor worked by the year twenty-five dollars for the whole family. I remember two of the Florida doctors, Chowning and Meredith. They not only tended an entire family for twenty-five dollars a year, but furnished the medicines themselves. Good measure, too. Only the largest persons could hold a whole dose. Castor oil was the principal beverage. The dose was half a dipperful, with half a dipperful of New Orleans molasses added to help it down and make it taste good, which it never did. The next standby was calomel, and the next rhubarb, and the next jalap. Then they bled the patient and put mustard plasters on him. It was a dreadful system, and yet the death rate was not heavy. The calomel was nearly sure to salivate the patient and cost him some of his teeth. There were no dentists. When teeth became touched with decay, or were otherwise ailing, the doctor knew of but one thing to do. He fetched his tongs and dragged them out. If the jaw remained, it was not his fault. Doctors were not called in cases of ordinary illness. The family grandmother attended to those. Every old woman was a doctor, and gathered her own medicines in the woods, and knew how to compound doses that would stir the vitals of a cast-iron dog. And then there was the Indian doctor, a grave savage, remnant of his tribe, deeply read in the mysteries of nature and the secret properties of herbs and most backwoodsmen had high faith in his powers and could tell of wonderful cures achieved by him. In Mauritius, away off yonder in the solitudes of the Indian Ocean, there is a person who answers to our Indian doctor of the old times. He is a negro, and has had no teaching as a doctor, yet there is one disease which he is master of, and can cure, and the doctors can't. They send for him when they have a case. It is a child's disease of a strange and deadly sort, and the negro cures it with an herb medicine which he makes himself, from a prescription which has come down to him from his father and grandfather. He will not let any one see it. He keeps the secret of its components to himself, and it is feared that he will die without divulging it. Then there will be consternation in Mauritius. I was told these things by the people there, in 1896. We had the faith doctor, too, in those early days. A woman. Her specialty was toothache. She was a farmer's old wife, and lived five miles from Hannibal. She would lay her hand on the patient's jaw and say, Believe! And the cure was prompt. Mrs. Uterbeck. I remember her very well. Twice I rode out there behind my mother, horseback, and saw the cure performed. My mother was the patient. Dr. Meredith removed to Hannibal by and by, and was our family physician there, and saved my life several times. Still, he was a good man, and meant well let it go. I was always told that I was a sickly and precarious and tiresome and uncertain child, and lived mainly on allopathic medicines during the first seven years of my life. I asked my mother about this in her old age, she was in her eighty-eighth year, and said, I suppose that during all that time you were uneasy about me. Yes, the whole time. Afraid I wouldn't live? After a reflective pause, ostensibly to think out the facts. 
No. Afraid you would. It sounds like a plagiarism, but it probably wasn't. The country schoolhouse was three miles from my uncle's farm. It stood in a clearing in the woods, and would hold about twenty-five boys and girls. We attended the school with more or less regularity once or twice a week in summer, walking to it in the cool of the morning by the forest path, and back in the gloaming at the end of the day. All the pupils brought their dinners in baskets, corn-dodger, buttermilk, and other good things, and sat in the shade of the trees at noon and ate them. It is the part of my education which I look back upon with the most satisfaction. My first visit to the school was when I was seven. A strapping girl of fifteen, in the customary sunbonnet and calico dress, asked me if I used tobacco, meaning did I chew it. I said no. It roused her scorn. She reported me to all the crowd, and said, Here is a boy seven years old who can't chew tobacco. By the looks and comments which this produced, I realized that I was a degraded object. I was cruelly ashamed of myself. I determined to reform. But I only made myself sick. I was not able to learn to chew tobacco, learned to smoke fairly well, but that did not conciliate anybody, and I remained a poor thing, and characterless. I longed to be respected, but I never was able to rise. Children have but little charity for each other's defects. As I have said, I spent some part of every year at the farm until I was twelve or thirteen years old. The life which I led there with my cousins was full of charm, and so is the memory of it yet. I can call back the solemn twilight and mystery of the deep woods, the earthy smells, the faint odors of the wild flowers, the sheen of the rain-washed foliage, the rattling clatter of drops when the wind shook the trees, the far-off hammering of woodpeckers, and the muffled drumming of wood pheasants in the remoteness of the forest, the snapshot glimpses of disturbed wild creatures scurrying through the grass. I can call it all back, and make it as real as it ever was, and as blessed. I can call back the prairie, and its loneliness and peace, and a vast hawk hanging motionless in the sky, with his wings spread wide, and the blue of the vault showing through the fringe of their end-feathers. I can see the woods in their autumn dress, the oaks purple, the hickories washed with gold, the maples and the sumacs luminous with crimson fires and I can hear the rustle made by the fallen leaves as we ploughed through them. I can see the blue clusters of wild grapes hanging amongst the foliage of the saplings, and I remember the taste of them and the smell. I know how the wild blackberries looked and how they tasted, and the same with the pawpaws, the hazelnuts, and the persimmons, and I can feel the thumping rain upon my head of hickory nuts and walnuts when we were out in the frosty dawn to scramble for them with the pigs, and the gusts of wind loosed them and sent them down. I know the stain of blackberries, and how pretty it is, and I know the stain of walnut hulls, and how little it mines soap and water, also what grudged experience it had of either of them. I know the taste of maple sap and when to gather it, and how to arrange the troughs and the delivery tubes, and how to boil down the juice, and how to hook the sugar after it is made, also how much better hooked sugar tastes than any that is honestly come by, let bigots say what they will. I know how a prize watermelon looks when it is sunning its fat rotundity among pumpkin vines and cymblins. I know how to tell when it is ripe without plugging it. I know how inviting it looks when it is cooling itself in a tub of water under the bed, waiting. I know how it looks when it lies on the table in the sheltered great floor-space between house and kitchen, and the children gathered for the sacrifice, and their mouths watering. I know the crackling sound it makes when the carving-knife enters its end, and I can see the split fly along in front of the blade as the knife cleaves its way to the other end. I can see its halves fall apart and display the rich red meat and the black seeds and the heart standing up, a luxury fit for the elect. I know how a boy looks behind a yard-long slice of that melon, and I know how he feels, for I have been there. I know the taste of the watermelon which has been honestly come by, and I know the taste of the watermelon which has been acquired by art. Both taste good, but the experienced know which tastes best. I know the look of green apples, and peaches, and pears on the trees, and I know how entertaining they are when they are inside of a person. I know how ripe ones look when they are piled in pyramids under the trees, and how pretty they are, and how vivid their colors. I know how a frozen apple looks in a barrel down cellar in the winter-time, 
and how hard it is to bite, and how the frost makes the teeth ache, and yet how good it is notwithstanding. I know the disposition of elderly people to select the speckled apples for the children, and I once knew ways to beat the game. I know the look of an apple that is roasting and sizzling on a hearth on a winter's evening, and I know the comfort that comes of eating it hot, along with some sugar and a drench of cream. I know the delicate art and mystery of so cracking hickory nuts and walnuts on a flat iron with a hammer that the kernels will be delivered whole, and I know how the nuts, taken in conjunction with winter apples, cider, and doughnuts, make old people's tales and old jokes sound fresh and crisp and enchanting, and juggle an evening away before you know what went with the time. I know the look of Uncle Dan'l's kitchen, as it was on privileged nights when I was a child, and I can see the white and black children grouped on the hearth, with the firelight playing on their faces and the shadows flickering upon the walls, clear back towards the cavernous gloom of the rear, and I can hear Uncle Dan'l telling the immortal tales which Uncle Remus Harris was to gather into his books and charm the world with by and by and I can feel again the creepy joy which quivered through me when the time for the ghost story of the golden arm was reached, and the sense of regret, too, which came over me, for it was always the last story of the evening, and there was nothing between it and the unwelcome bed. I can remember the bare wooden stairway in my uncle's house, as it turned to the left above the landing, and the rafters, and the slanting roof over my bed, and the squares of moonlight on the floor and the white cold world of snow outside, seen through the curtainless window. I can remember the howling of the wind and the quaking of the house on stormy nights, and how snug and cozy one felt under the blankets, listening, and how the powdery snow used to sift in around the sashes, and lie in little ridges on the floor, and make the place look chilly in the morning, and curb the wild desire to get up, in case there was any. I can remember how very dark that room was in the dark of the moon, and how packed it was with ghostly stillness when one woke up by accident away in the night, and forgotten sins came flocking out of the secret chambers of the memory and wanted a hearing, and how ill-chosen the time seemed for this kind of business, and how dismal was the hoo-hooing of the owl and the wailing of the wolf sent mourning by on the night wind. I remember the raging of the rain on that roof, summer nights, and how pleasant it was to lie and listen to it and enjoy the white splendor of the lightning and the majestic booming and crashing of the thunder. It was a very satisfactory room, and there was a lightning rod which was reachable from the window, an adorable and skittish thing to climb up and down summer nights when there were duties on hand of a sort to make privacy desirable. I remember the coon and possum hunts, nights with the negroes, and the long marches through the black gloom of the woods, and the excitement which fired every one when the distant bay of an experienced dog announced that the game was freed. Then the wild scramblings and stumblings through briars and bushes and over roots to get to the spot. Then the lighting of a fire and the felling of the tree, the joyful frenzy of the dogs and the negroes, and the weird picture it all made in the red glare. I remember it all well and the delight that every one got out of it, except the coon. I remember the pigeon seasons, when the birds would come in millions and cover the trees, and by their weight break down the branches. They were clubbed to death with sticks, guns were not necessary, and were not used. I remember the squirrel hunts, and the prairie chicken hunts, and the wild turkey hunts, and all that, and how we turned out, mornings, while it was still dark to go on these expeditions, and how chilly and dismal it was, and how often I regretted that I was well enough to go. A toot on a tin horn brought twice as many dogs as were needed, and in their happiness they raced and scampered about, and knocked small people down, and made no end of unnecessary noise. At the word they vanished away toward the woods, and we drifted silently after them in the melancholy gloom. But presently the gray dawn stole over the world. The birds piped up, then the sun rose, and poured light and comfort all around. Everything was fresh and dewy and fragrant, and life was a boon again. After three hours of tramping we arrived back wholesomely tired, overladen with game, very hungry, and just in time for breakfast. Mark Twain To Be Continued